What happens when we die? Regardless of religious persuasion or cultural background, there is an undeniable fascination with the afterlife. And in Angel Studios' latest feature film, After Death, best-selling authors, doctors, scientists, and survivors bring us a cinematic peek beyond the veil, examining the various dimensions of our mortality. Today, I'm so happy and honored to be joined by the producer of this film, Jason Pamer. Welcome to 100 Huntley Street. Great to be with you. Thanks for having me. It's so great to have you with us today, Jason. You know, you've had great successes telling stories of human trafficking and climate change, worked with some of Hollywood's A-listers like Jada Pinkett Smith and Steph Curry. But what was it about this film that drew you in? I think first it was uh, Steve and Chris, the directors, the amount of time they had put in, how thoughtful they were on how to tell the story. When they sent over sort of the first draft of some of the ways they wanted to approach the story, it was it was clear that this was uh, deeply impacting them. And so that will come through in a film. And then I think it's rare as a producer to be able to touch a story that literally can and should touch all of humanity. Usually from a filmmaking standpoint, you wanna find a distinct story for a distinct audience. And, and that's sort of the, the best path forward. This was one of those rare occurrences where it was like, well, death touches all of us. Um, we can't escape it. And so this was something that compelled Jens and I, my producing partner, to go, okay, it's worth taking three years of our lives or more uh, to go tell this story. It's definitely a theme that does touch us all for sure. I think it bears mentioning that authors like Don Piper and John Burke are featured in the film, both of which have been guests on our show before. And I have to say, having the opportunity to view the screener, I was moved to tears many times as I watched some of these stories, these first-person accounts, survivors as you refer to them. But is there one specific story that, that moved you, Jason? Mm. I think there's two. One is Howard Storm, who had a hellish experience, which you don't hear much about. And it's for obvious reasons, right? It's, it's riddled with shame and why when I saw the next life that I see hell. So there's a lot of this mixed up in there. But his story was one that was so profound. I don't want to give too much away, but he, he finds himself uh, in the midst of some of the darkest, most scary moments with the most scary and dark beings pretty much tearing him apart. And, and he reflects back as a little boy being taken into a church and remember, uh, remembering a hymn and that hymn comes back to him. And all of a sudden racing through the cosmos is this love that rips him up from there. And he he's debating with this, with this cosmic love. Like, I don't, I don't belong here. He's getting the life reviews. Like, I don't belong here. And God says, we don't make mistakes. You do belong here. And it was this profound emotional climax in the film that I remember being there for the interview, just being wrecked. Uh, the, the grace that was embedded in that moment, the the sacrifice and the the saving of him. So that that was one that deeply moved me. And then Dr. Mary Neal, who's an orthopedic surgeon, she had her own NDE and in her life review, she saw how her life had impacted 30 degrees out. Not, not 30 total people, 30 degrees out. So you have a cousin who has a brother, who has a son, who has a friend, who, and you go 30 people out. And the point was, every decision you make in this life matters. It's, 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 it's important to sort of look toward the afterlife, but it also helps frame today and the conversations you're gonna have today and the people that you interact with today. And so that, those two things left a lasting impression on me and I think will stick with me for the rest of my days here. Well, I can attest to the impact of those stories indeed. Remarkable, among others in the film. You know, I think it's interesting, Jason, that we often hear about near-death experiences being described as someone being surrounded by this overwhelming light or peace, but not all of the accounts in the film tell this story. And I think it's interesting that 23% of NDEs that are accounted for describe somewhat more of a fearful experience or a darkness surrounding them. Why did you feel it was important to tell that side of the story? Oh, that's such a good question. I think it's a, a more complete picture. I mean, it's an honest picture. You know, it's 23% of reported NDE stories. So it likely is greater in terms of the overall NDE experience, but reported. And 
you know, I touched on this earlier, but it's because it's it's very riddled with shame mm-hmm. and, and why I saw that. And it's hard for them to, to reflect on it. I mean, it's it's hard enough for people to reflect on the, the goodness that they saw in heaven, but it's hard for them to put earthly words to it. Even more difficult to reflect on the most isolating, painful experience that they've ever had. So I think for us, it was like it was it was helpful in terms of contrasting. I think as a, as you know, a storyteller, it's important to find the contrast because in the contrast, there's beauty, and that's why Howard's story wrecked me so much. Was this extreme cosmic contrast between being, you know, destroyed and isolated, and then rescued from that, and, and, and in that distance. I think there is great beauty. You know what was fascinating to me, Jason, is the fact that people from different backgrounds, age groups, sighted, non-sighted individuals, people that have been blind from birth, all used similar language to describe what they experienced. Everything from sound and color, touch. I mean, their senses overall were heightened. What do you think this particular detail points us toward? Yeah, you nailed it. The uniformity in experience. I think there's something like over 30 similar data points across global NDE stories. It doesn't matter which culture or religion you grew up in or no religion at all. It, 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 people are describing a similar experience of meeting this, this love, this being of light, having a chance to review their choices and the way they've lived their lives. Most of them describing they don't want to come back, but their job is not done yet. They need to go back. And then, you know, the thing that really convinced me in part was they didn't have much to gain. In fact, it ruined lives. It tore marriages apart. It it was isolating in its own way. I mean, Mm -hmm. Howard's marriage and family did not survive him coming back and telling his experience. So they had a lot to lose. And yet they felt convicted and convinced that they needed to share. And so that was something in our, you know, in our casting process, we wanted to find stories sourced from around the world and in a a montage in the film, there are voices represented from cultures all around the globe. Yeah, and to your point about some of those stories, Jason, I noticed that many of those subjects struggled to communicate what they'd experienced with their families, just their families not being able to comprehend what their loved ones had gone through and the reality that they experienced in that near-death experience. Um, You know, what do you hope that viewers will take away from this film? I think they're left with a sense of great hope that the creator of the entire universe desperately wants relationship Mm -hmm. with them and that there's an opportunity to bring heaven to earth in the way that we treat others. I mean, this was when Howard was having this debate with essentially the Trinity. He's like, well, what do I do? And they're like, love one another. And he's like, that's it. That's, that's, that's not hard. And they're like, trust us. That'll change the course of history if you can do that. And so I want people, you know, th- th- this film is going to meet people in grief and loss. And that was how it met Steve and, and compelled Steve to move into making this film. And, you know, some of us on our team have experienced uh, death in, in the family recently. And I think this is, again, one of those human experiences. And so we want people to to walk through the door of grief into the room of hope. Mm-hmm. And this room is is hopefully the film is a participant in the room to, to contribute to the conversation that there is something worth looking forward to, and then there is something worth living for here. Indeed, and, um, you know, I I can't say this, I can't stress this enough to our viewers, having screened the film myself, um, certainly had, uh, uh, will have a lasting impact on me, and uh, I can't encourage you enough to go out and see the film. We're going to give you details in just a moment uh, as to where it will be playing across uh, theaters in North America. Um, Jason, considering all that's going on in the world right now, Wars, we look at what's happening in Israel, we look at what's happening in Ukraine, various parts of the world, economic struggle, people fearful of what, you know, the next couple of years will look like in terms of, you know, the economy and interest rates and the list goes on and on. We could just rhyme off a ton of things that can make us feel anxious. What is so timely about this message now? You matter. Your story matters. 
it's part of a global tapestry and it is more intricately woven together than, than we will ever know. My prayer and hope is that people can get a glimpse of that though. And that's what these life reviews have allowed the people in our film to go to, to, to see into is that this whole thing is, is beautifully woven together and you are a thread in that and you matter and you make up this beautiful, beautiful picture of humanity. And today is tough and tomorrow may be tough, but there are those um, that need you and, uh, and they need to be in relationship with you. And so there's the great hope ahead of us, but there is sort of the, the, um, the reality of today. And I think we need to continue to try to strive and see the Imago Day in all of us, that there is something that connects all of us way more foundationally than separates us. Separation is on the surface, but there is something more core to being a human that actually unites all of us. And this is uh, part of the Imago Day. I think that's a great way to wrap our time together here, Jason, reminding us that we are God's image bearers as his creation. And to make the here and now count by loving each other and just knowing that we have a promise of eternity with him is such a beautiful uh, reminder for us today. And thank you for pouring your heart and soul into this film. Um, this film is definitely for not just the believer, but for the skeptic. So go into theaters with an open mind. I know it's going to capture you. It's going to capture your family members and get you all thinking about your mortality. You know, the Bible tells us that God has a plan and a purpose for each one of us. And uh, that we don't have to go through life with a sense of uncertainty. So if you're walking this journey of life and you don't really know, and you're a little concerned now, maybe even after hearing my conversation with Jason, know that you can have a certainty of life eternal with Jesus. And that's why we're here day in and day out delivering the hope that is found in Jesus and the hope of life eternal. The film is called After Death. It's hitting silver screens across North America. We're so excited. It's going to be here in Canada too. I think it's 2,000 plus theaters between, uh, you know, America and Canada. And uh, for you to get information, we've got a great partnership with Angel Studios. You can go to crossroads.ca forward slash after death to get all the information. There's a way you can pay it forward. There's a way that you can collect on those that have paid it forward if you can't afford to go. They don't want resources or funding to be a reason why you don't go and see this film. After death, I promise you your life will be impacted. It has impacted me. Thank you so much for being with us, Jason. I can't wait to speak to you again. Thanks for having me. It was 1969, the beautiful day to fly. We were about 100 feet above the ground when I started noticing that something was wrong. It was engine failure. Trees were filling our windshield. I found myself above the crash site. And while I'm processing what I'm looking at, I can see a pilot, and this is me. No two near-death experiences are the same. Out of nowhere, a trailer truck kept me head on. But they typically occur in a very consistent process. We began to go down the river, and my boat became pinned. I was drowning. The first thing that happens is called an out-of-body experience. And they come to a place of exquisite beauty. They very commonly see a light. Deceased relatives come to meet them. The first person I saw was my grandfather. Now I'm traveling like a rocket ship, straight upwards. And with that... <gasps> oh my God, I'm alive! But not every near-death experience is a good one. 23% had hellish experiences. I saw a black tunnel. I mean, just falling. I wasn't in fear. I was in terror. It was just darkness. Put me back. I don't belong here. I heard a voice before I woke up. You still have a purpose on Earth. I was very skeptical. I never felt alive and then dead. I felt alive and then more alive had full brain recordings from the dying human brain. Even though they were unconscious, they were able to give corroborative evidence. She's described herself that she just shouldn't know. The same right. You can't be mystified by that question. What happens after you die? 
this really does show that there is life after death.